Welcome everybody to the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association's web uh, <laughs> Facebook page and our interview series. We are doing three separate types of programming over the next couple of months. One is Meet the Moderators, which we're going to be conducting today. We also have Meet Our HCM Experts and Share Your Story. If you're interested in sharing your story in the interview fashion with the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association and our Facebook community, Please send an email to support at 4hcm.org with your story, and we will get in touch with you. And maybe you can be on Facebook with me talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and helping us raise awareness. So we're letting people come populate in here. So we're kind of giving a little prologue here so we can get some uh, audience members ready. At the end of today's discussion, we'll take some general questions and we'll answer them to the best of our ability. Today, we are doing a Meet the Moderator with our dear friend from the Netherlands, Marion, and I'm going to let Marion introduce herself and pronounce her last name appropriately because I'm not very good at it. Marion, welcome to the program. Thank you, Lisa. My name is Van Sintruijen, but don't bother with that. That's far too difficult. <laughs> so sorry. And Marion, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from and a little bit about your background? Well, I'm Dutch. I come from a Dutch peasant family, gene carriers, and um, I'm an economist. Um, I stopped working some time ago, um, living off my savings until my retirement um, comes off. And um, I'm a singer. I sing Johann Sebastian Bach as much as I possibly can, even with HM, you could do that. And that's who I am. I did not know that you were a singer. There's this element about you I had no idea. Well, you oh. never asked. No, I did not ever ask if you were a singer. You're completely right on that one. So um, next time we get together, I'm going to hear you sing. Of course. So tell us when the first time was that you heard the terms hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, that was after, by chance, um, I was given an examination in my office and I, because of the singing, I was interested to get a medical free test because they were going to test my ears. Um, unfortunately, however, they also um, uh, gave me an ECG and that was abnormal and it says um, left ventricular hypertrophy and um, anterior movement of the mitral valve, systolic anterior movement. So that was in the pre-internet days in, uh, in 1997. Mm -hmm. So I ran to the public library, got the Codex Medica, looked it up, what is a ventricular hypertrophy, and found the term hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I thought, can I have this? That's ridiculous. Because my father died when he was 60 and, uh, 60 and I was 28 suddenly. And... Um, I was given to understand that I didn't have it at the time, so I was totally oblivious of that was anything the matter with me. Um, and then I went to the cardiologist, and then I got the diagnosis, and that was when I learned the term, so that's late 90s. So late 1990s, and when was the first time you heard about the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association? I googled uh, as soon as that was possible. I think that was two years later, 1999. And then I found you and the story about your sister, the picture of Lori in the very basic website. And I was touched by the story and I sent you an email. You replied and um, you were, um, of course, it was early days and there wasn't a lot of literature about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, not a lot of scientific literature as yet. That all came in this century. And I tend to, uh, tended to forget about it for many, many years because my ignorant cardiologist always told me that my HEM was insignificant, uninteresting. The only risk that I had was sudden death. And as long as I didn't have any ventricular arrhythmias, there was really a non-issue. So that's how I was checked for 18 years with incidental echoes, with alarming signs which he didn't see so then later i um, got back to your website found all sorts of things that i should have known before 
and Googled like a maniac. And um, when it was too late, when they told me I was in end stage and it was all absolutely hopeless four years ago, I Skyped with you and that was a memorable experience. You showed me your ICD and you said you need an ICD, you've fallen off the cliff and this is all very serious and you need a good doctor. So that's the significance of your existence in the HMA for me. Well, I'm glad you have been part of your journey and the HCMA is glad to be here for a lot of people. But you're all the way in the Netherlands and I'm in New Jersey. And there's not a lot of subspecialty care in your country. How did you get to knowledgeable care for your HCM? Google. And I found that there was a specialist in Rotterdam and I rang Rotterdam for desperately trying to... to get them to take me in and the man retired two months before so I burst into tears I thought well I'm lost I'm totally lost and I saw that there was a lady who um, was in his stead and I had no idea that she was absolutely wonderful and that she was a real HM specialist because I knew nothing so I went to another university hospital and they did take me in and they did examine me and they did say it was all Hopeless, but they also said that they thought that HEM was not the real cause of this hay fog that had been um, apparent in my heart. They didn't tell me like an American cardiologist told one of our group members, your heart looks as if a dog chewed on it. But that's what it um, sort of, um, that's what they meant. Yeah, doctors um, have a unique way with terms sometimes. <laughs> Yes, it wasn't very elegant, but it was very uh, enlightening for me. And um, Googling away, I found an article about end stage in which it was precisely described what I had. And then I thought, this is it. This is my description. Um, this is what it must be. And the article was by Dr. Jacopo Olivotto from Florence. He's one of the leading HEM specialists and a wonderful person. Well, since then, a lot have happened. I went to Florence. I've been in touch with you and with him and with all the HEM doctors in the Netherlands, which do exist, but I didn't know them at the time. And then it was finally confirmed that it was the HEM which was responsible for um, the process of destroying my heart. And uh, that felt like, um, like a relief. And then they found my gene, finally, which is very ordinary gene the um, myosin binding PC3 gene and it was a kind of comfort to have, comfort to have a diagnose because I think you can better have a, um, a very unfavorable diagnose than uncertainty because that really consumes you it's not the same for anybody else but that's how it works for me and what is your treatment today for your HCM? just pills <clears throat> I, I would hope that um, people would realize that end stage is a is not the end. It's not a nice way to describe it. It's the correct term is burnt out, HEM. And we should also realize that life is a progressive condition. We all deteriorate. If you um, look at medical books and you see the human body shrivel and become um, so different from what it was um, when you compare it to when you were 20 or 30, you must realize that things happen to your heart as well. So a certain extent of progression is normal. For HEM hearts, especially when they're under duress, maybe also by unhealthy lifestyles or by stress or whatever you can think of, then it's or diabetes, then it becomes more severe. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the heart will deteriorate to the point um, where the real burnt out um, fraction is. It might stop somewhere and you may remain stable on medication. So if you have progression that might be pretty normal and it might not be as hopeless a, as you might fear it to be. Let's talk a little bit about structure and cells. You had a little prop there that we talked about before. And a lot of people have this theory that HCM is all about thickness and yeah. how yeah. thick is your heart and you can determine, you know, what's going to happen to you by how thick your heart is. Your heart's not very thick, is it? Not anymore. It's thinned. 
And it always strikes me when I look at the questions um, at, uh, on, on, in our Facebook group that people seem to think about the heart in a more static way than I think they should do. They, um, you know, the whole the whole issue about the heart is that it, it fills and it squeezes. We have a very hard squeeze, and when the heart is thicker, we have a difficult filling so you can have a hard squeeze squeeze of a half full balloon but it doesn't render as much blood as a, a normal squeeze of a full balloon and people tend to think it's all about sickness but if you look at this this is knitted now I don't know how your knitting is but mine is pretty lousy <laughs> so if I knit anything it looks as if sort of a dog chewed on it um, our cells are not neatly like this. And, you know, this you can, it's elastic. But the more disarray you have in the stitches, the harder it becomes for the heart to behave orderly. And the real problem of HEM is the disarray in the cells. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a thick heart to be problematic. Because the disarray of the cells can also disturb the small vessels which you need to uh, keep your muscle tissue alive. And it might also interfere with the electrical system. So if you think, oh, my heart's not that thick, my heart was also not that thick, and I was seemingly unobstructed. Maybe we'll talk about that later, about provocable obstruction. But um, it, it didn't look serious to anyone, not even to my cardiologist, but it was. But that's because the disarray of the cells is not visible to anyone. Because you can only see it if you cut the heart out and when you slice it and put it on the microscope, then you can see the structure of the muscle and the real impact of HEM. So <clears throat> as Marion and I were getting ready to go live <laughs> today, the FedEx man came to my office. And this is an unannounced announcement. Um, for those of you who know, I received a heart transplant about 11 and a half months ago, and I sent my heart out to be plastinized. And that is a process in which the heart is dehydrated and rehydrated with plastinization. And my heart was delivered to my desk just moments ago, and I am going to pick it up out of the bag for the first time. This is half of my heart. It smells awful right now because it smells like plastic resin. But this is my plastinized heart. It's pretty hard. It's a little soft. It, it will move, but I have to give it a couple more months to, plastic, to harden. But you see those white streaks in this particular region. That's scarring. You don't have to have a thick heart to have a lot of scar. I had a thick heart. But that scar is what part of the problem in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is. So this little girl's got a lot of work to do in teaching us all about HCM, and we have another one that's in process of being made from um, a, a lovely member of HCMA who unfortunately did not do well through the transplant earlier this week, um, but her heart is being shipped out today to be plastinized as well. The idea of what Marianne was talking about, about cell structure, you can't always see that. And from the outside, we look pretty darn normal. And I think that's part of the confusion and frustration within the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy community, both those clinically treating us and those of us living with it. So, uh, yes, Michael, that was cool. Bring that up in a minute. So, Marion, let's talk a little bit more about what it's like to communicate online with our community. Um, we, we moved from our message board to the Facebook community as a primary source of communication um, probably about four years ago. And while the message board is still there, it's not where most people like to talk. They like to talk here on Facebook. So um, you started talking more on Facebook, and I saw your brilliant mind at work, and I thought it would be a great addition as a moderator. And how has that experience been for you? Well, I think I hope the group is very beneficial for all these lone souls from uh, Albania to Lebanon to Saudi Arabia and uh, Oregon 
who think they are the only ones. So the recognition and the emotional support are very important, but also to um, raise awareness for the issues that have to be raised. Um, the tailor-made advice comes from you when they um, contact the HMA by telephone and send in the data. But um, HEM is very complex and expression of HEM is very different even within a family with the same gene mut mutation. But the basic subjects about HEM, I would hope that many people would be able to learn about them to the extent that they want to do. It's the issue of obstruction and rhythm and progression and um, you know, ventricular rhythm and the and the impossible to treat AFib, which is also a very big issue. So there are sort of chapters that you can know something about to have the conversation with your doctor. And I think the group does help to um, raise awareness about these subjects. Um, but also, I'm, I'm a bit apprehensive sometimes because you don't want to scare people. And um, I, I, I lost nearly a night's sleep a couple of weeks ago because there was a lady and she was going to have a myectomy in a non-COA and sort of everybody came down on her, um, including me, like a ton of bricks about COAs. And, um, well, apparently she wasn't going to um, to back out and that's, of course, too far-fetched. But also you don't want to frighten people. But on the other hand... Even myectomy is undertaken lightly. Um, I mean, in Holland, I, I have been able to persuade somebody to go to Rotterdam rather than somewhere else, um, to my relief. But um, another member um, did go to a different hospital. Of course, you don't know how it would have gone. Would it have gone better somewhere else? But this lady, um, well, I, I keep thinking, you know, should we have you know, give her more words of encouragement rather than words of warning. I find it very difficult. When when do you try to stop somebody and when do you think, oh, well, you know, have some confidence, you'll be all right? That's hard. Well, I think what we need to do and have people understand is we're going to give you some data through the HCMA, through the Facebook communication about what we know our best practices. And why we're why we know them to be the best practices. If somebody chooses to not follow best practices, and there's a million reasons why sometimes it just can't be done, whether it be sure. financial, geographic, psychological, there's lots of reasons why people might not be able to get to the level of care we hope that they would get to. You also have to make sure that they have realistic expectations and that they've asked the right questions because in some cases when these procedures are done in low volume centers, the outcomes are disastrous and disaster means death. And people need to understand what true informed consent means. We can tell them as a community, no, 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 we've seen disasters before and it doesn't mean anything to them. Um, but we can also tell them we've seen successes and look at all of the successes that we have on the board and they probably speak louder than the disasters because disasters don't talk. They're gone. So we have to help people learn how to make good decisions, how to ask good questions, how to choose the correct provider for them. And as I said, I wish we could get everybody to, you know, our center of excellence level care throughout the world, but it's just not available for everybody. No. Um, we're, we're hoping to, you were at the summit this fall and in, in Boston and we talked about you know breaking out internationally and listing those programs on on our website as well so we're going to hopefully do that within the next uh, 12 to 18 months we're going to get more collaboration there but in the United States we have a completely broken healthcare system and sometimes people can't get out of the state that they live in and there's no specialist there so we have to do the best with what we've got or we have to fight appeals I personally like appeals because I think we, we can make logical decisions and make a good choice for, for making those referrals out of network. And we win a lot of them. We don't win all of them, but we win a lot of them. So 
I would encourage people to do that both in the United States and abroad and get to the highest level of care you can get to. But as moderators, we battle with that. And I don't think any of our moderator crew takes any of those conversations lightly. And I think we've all lost a night or two of sleep over somebody's decision making. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I did post the article by Dr. Steve Oman, um, in which he, that's an article that any lay person can read, which is called A Clarion Call to Do What's Right, in mm -hmm. which he describes the, uh, the results in, in more lay terms about a, a very broad, uh, research project about the outcome of myectomies and um, I would ideally uh, like um, every patient to read that article which is why I posted it but I felt bad about it having done it afterwards think god you know if she goes into that theater room you know frightened um, I yeah that's what you don't want yet you 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 need that information to have informed consent it's hard it, it's, it is hard, and, and there are other decisions that need to be made. You know, people get defibrillators, and they might not actually need them. Other people won't get a defibrillator when they really do need them. Yeah. Some people don't want to take their medications, and we're, we're hearing people talk in a way that they don't normally talk to their doctors, explaining, well, I'm cutting them in half because I don't have the money, and, you know, it doesn't really matter. And you, I'll just stop taking it, and we have to encourage them to please have a communication with their physician to not make bad decisions for themselves. Um, we have people yep. who I know really need to be evaluated for transplant, and that is a very big psychological leap to get to transplant, and they aren't going there. I have other people who are fragile and deciding to get pregnant while their own health hasn't been balanced yet. Pregnancy mm -hmm. in HCN is possible, but not if you're not a stable patient. So I know I've lost more than a couple of nights of sleep over the, the years between message boards and Facebook. But um, part of the reason we I wanted you as one of our moderators is because while we're sleeping, you're awake because you're in Europe. Yeah. Yes. And vice versa. So we have this around the clock coverage where there's eyes on that board almost all the time yeah. from a moderator or at least a, a knowledgeable user of the page as well. So I, I love that aspect of our community. Um, so you, you mentioned something earlier in the interview about your original doctors, and you used a word, I wrote it down, and it was ignorant. Yeah. And that's a harsh word, but a very valid word in many healthcare providers dealing with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They're, they're wonderful people, they probably know a lot of other things really well, but they don't always understand hypertrophic cardiomyopathy really well, in part because, this is my cheat sheet over here, of my copy of the HCM guidelines. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, not an in, that's not a little document. Mm -hmm. There's about 70 pages, and it's complicated. So have you found your new team of physicians to be not ignorant <laughs> yeah well there are of course different types of doctors um i'm not going to quote Do rumsfeld well, i think i i do need a little quote of rumsfeld um you can't know what you don't know these are the unknown unknowns you can't blame people for people for things they don't know you can blame for people for not reading the guidelines um, the European guidelines exist since 2014. Uh, the American guidelines, I think, the first ones were 2008 or 2000. And you know, the guideline document here came out in 2011, but we had a consensus document back in consensus 2000. Consensus documents, right. 2011 with guidelines. So there's no excuse if you don't read them. So when the European guidelines became public, I was, you know, over the moon. I thought, ah. Oh, this is the end of all our problems. I mean, the word has been spoken. Everybody can look it up and, you know, paradise will start. Well, it didn't because uh, nobody read it. Well, not nobody, but um, quite a lot of people didn't read it. So um, they need to be rolled out. And that's a process which is taking years and years. And you've been 
in that process, even without guidelines, for decades. So um, you, of all people, know um, how hard it all is to uh, penetrate into the cardiology community. And of course, the first thing is the education. Now, in the Netherlands, we have an HEM doctor now on the board of the Dutch Society for Cardiology. So she is um, doing her part to integrate it uh, in the in the uh, regular training and also to have um, conferences and, uh, you know, to do all she can to roll out the guidelines. But that's just one country in Europe. So, yes, my present doctors, um, I was at the, the uh, conference in Boston with my own cardiologist. <laughs> I saw that. I like that. It was a bit, it was awkward. It was awkward for him and it was awkward for me. So we, you know, became informal and we said to each other, well, we're going to back into the formal situation when we get back. Um, but I, I love it that he was there and um, it's okay in that hospital. But we do have a long way to go here because there are eight academic centers, but the level of knowledge and the care path for HEM is, is really very diverse. And we need to work on that. And luckily, um, we have here a wonderful team of HM experts on our side who all want the same thing. And my little heart sister, Patricia, uh, and, and I, she's also got HM. She and I are on the team with those people in a project with, a, I think they have a European subsidy of 5 million euros for HM in the Netherlands. Um, that's predominantly for cardiac cell research but also um, what they say, translational medicine to mm -hmm. bring the care and the um, scientific community closer to the patients and to exchange knowledge. So the fact that we are together in this project is extremely helpful um, for us, but also surprisingly for them, because um, they told me that uh, we were the first patients they ever spoke to. <laughs> but they're researchers and the clinical people, um, they, of course, see patients every day. They're also very enthusiastic to be part of this project. So it's um, it's going well in this country, but that's what we need in every country. I think you've done your part in the U.S. Yes, but, but in a sense, because of what I've done in the U.S. and I know Patricia and I know you and we give you these weapons to go communicate with. And now the Netherlands is getting in line. So I feel at some point um, the work of the HCMA gave you the information that you needed to take to your country to facilitate meaningful long-term change for millions. The 17 million people that live in your country weren't getting the appropriate care for HCM. And because of your efforts, Patricia's efforts, and a little nudge from some girl from Jersey, we've moved them in the right direction. And True. I'm... I know many of the physicians in the program, and you have some very knowledgeable and wonderful people there. And I'm looking forward to being able to to work with them closer as we develop different programs for the international community. So we that's all. Of, sorry, we had a bit of a delay, of course, because you, uh, when when I spoke to you first, I found it very shocking that you told me uh, what stage you were in, because it was then I realized that you were in stage two. And you didn't speak about that publicly by then. That was four years ago. And later you became transparent about it. But um, it, it was uh, then that we also spoke about maybe portals per country to roll it all out. Mm -hmm. and we were in Florence at the conference and you on your high, high heels ran ahead of me uh, like, a, like a hare. And I thought, how can she do this with her heart? But of course, one year later... Things went totally wrong, and um, well, thank God you survived. Yeah. And you even survived the transplant. You made it to the transplant. You survived it, which is, of course, absolutely wonderful for you, but very wonderful for you know thousands of other people. Um, but that whole process with you did uh, delay a lot of your plans. So, you know, the, the thing that we spoke about, about rolling it out internationally, um, I can see that you're gearing up now. And I do hope you will um, not, as we say in Holland, throw away the baby with the bath water, uh, which means you look after yourself first and oh, then yeah. help your children. 
Mama Bear, mm -hmm. and then we can see what we can do. There's a lot that can be done. Quite a lot of this is a lot easier than we thought, and there's going to be some new um, online tools from the HCMA coming out with our new um, patient portal that will be launched later this year. Um, there'll be a, your ability to take questionnaires and to share and query information um, based upon your user status, etc. Um, I'll be doing future talks on that. But the one amazing thing that we'll be able to do now is partner with our research community in a much more um, uh, time efficient way to really get down to the core problem. So we will not only have clinical data on patients who wish to share it with us, but we have more lifestyle experiences and more uh, insight from our point of view as the patients that can help mold care models in the future to include not only taking care of the, the left ventricle or maybe the left atria, but also to take care of our mental health, our weight, our, our diet, our exercise, um, our non-cardiac related medical issues. There are a lot of things that do tie in together and we need to make sure that we're being treated as a whole patient, not in, in pieces of people. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to getting that program up and running. It should be soon. The other thing you'll all be able to do on this is log in and go through about a 25-minute process. And at the end, you'll be able to print out your own family pedigree, knowing who needs to be screened, who's okay, what pathway the HCM might go down, and help you identify those family members so everybody gets screened appropriately. So that's going to be very exciting. We'll be Good, I'm soon. looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Okay, so let's get to some questions, shall we? Um, if anybody has questions, you can type them now. There's a couple comments I'm going to pop up here. So um, let's see where we're going to start. Deb, um, she used to be a singer too, but she can't catch her breath so well now. So maybe you guys can talk online and share tips on, on how to breathe and sing with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Please do not ask me to sing. I do not want to torture anybody. Um, and I don't have HCM anymore. Kathy's granddaughter has um, HCM, so welcome, and we're going to be here to help your daughter. Michael, I think, was commenting on my heart when I held it up, and he called it very cool. Uh, Michael, also, what did you have to say here? I was impressed when my local cardiologist came right out and said, she can't help me. Together, the MD uh, and myself found the HCMA, best decision. I went to the OR, peaceful, and that you were in good hands at Tufts. And Michael, if you're still with us, I believe that was for your myectomy, and then we've moved on. Your transplant wasn't there, was it? We'll see. Um, Patricia, you asked where we can get, you can get the guidelines, and Carmina, my last interview on Facebook, was kind enough to give you the link to the uh, HCM journal guidelines. You can also get them uh, directly from the HCMA website, go to public uh, HCM publications, articles of interest, and you can download the guidelines at any time. It's, it's a free download for everybody. You don't have to be a member to get that access in the website. There is There are parts of the, the website that are member access only, so you pay your membership and it unlocks a lot of video product and uh, you get you know other benefits from membership. So, um, you can just pop in there and get what you need. Oh, that's okay, Carmina. I appreciate you putting the link. It, it, the link to AHA is fine. AHA has it, ACC has it, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so Michael, yes, you, your myectomy was tough and your transplant with that in common. Um, no problem there. Um, it took a lot, a lot to look forward to. Can Marion sing something for us? Early one morning as the sun was rising. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll get it more one day. Okay, that was sweet. Um, and I think one of my staff popped in and got the link to the guidelines. So there's the, the link to the guideline. Okay. Um, Marion, is there any parting words you'd like to give and tell us a little bit about what it has been like for you to be a Facebook moderator? Um... Oh, it takes a lot of time um, because I also do it for the Dutch group, which is broader than just HCM. Um, but um, it's um, 
it's good if you feel when when somebody feels himself or herself heard and supported that's very um rewarding you then you that makes you happy too um and when i see people interact with each other it's also um wonderful people can be so kind and 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 supportive to each other i really think that's very touching um and uh, well i think it's useful so that's why i do it um there was something else that um suddenly occurred to me uh we don't talk a lot about breathing um i've also found that many people they breathe high they don't breathe low and as hm patients we need all the oxygen we can get and i think it makes a whole lot of difference also because this other lady who sang uh, mentioned it the lower you breathe the more you've got you mean diaphragm breathing yes it's what singers do it's what teachers have to do it's what people who speak in public have to do and it also helps your heart and if you if you think oh i don't know how to do it um what helps is when you smell when you close your mouth and breathe deeply and smell you feel your abdomen swell up that's probably illogical because your lungs are here but that's how you breathe deeply and with hgm it does make a difference when you breathe properly because when you breathe superficially you're already heart uh, heart which has uh, difficulties um will starve for oxygen so breathe low breathe slowly you don't say lowly and slowly you say low and slowly why mm -hmm. well we're not you know doing grammar here that's for gordon gordon talks <laughs> <laughs> you should explain this to me um and that's one other thing that occurred to me that because you said the 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 new setup will also um deal with the patient as a whole it's a very simple thing but it does help um and the same with anxieties what i've learned from the group that was another thing is how devastating anxiety can be and how it will also be eventually if you if you stick in it will be bad for your health and it's all very well to say well if you're less scared the problem will be smaller but when you are scared to death you need help so um and when you when you can find it in a group that's fine you know talk about it don't deny it but let fear um happen and don't try to suppress it if it's there but deal with it and that takes time and it's a process we've you know we're all scared when they said to me you're end stage i thought i might be dead within a year i didn't even want to buy um uh, more toothpaste than just one container which is really very silly because i've used quite a lot of toothpaste since because i've been in end stage for five years now as my father said should i buy green bananas or not <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, it's green green banana. Banana. you'll be here for when they're ripe um <laughs> So you bring up some excellent points about some of the conversations that happen in the Facebook group. And I do hope people who watch this off the, the page use the opportunity to join the group. We've had a lot join just in the past couple of weeks since Facebook gave us the opportunity to link groups with our page. Um, so I, I hope you all consider joining in that group. And, the, and you don't have to write every day, but when, when you need support or you have a question, it's a nice place to just pop in and say, hey, what can you do for me here? And can you answer this question? But I will admit that there is a, a little bit of a downside of, of the community, and that is what's happened this week. And that is, as best as we try, and as successful as we have been in helping people survive with HCM, it doesn't always work out the way that we want because the human body is very fallible. And this week we lost a young lady in New Zealand, uh, Margie Inski, also known as Purpleness, who will be laid to rest later uh, this week in New Zealand, uh, nine years after her heart transplant. And yesterday um, I was devastated to share with the group that longtime member and friend of mine uh, for a decade, uh, Irene, um, well, she was Wilson at that time, but and, and she went back to her maiden name of Lindenberger, uh, passed away yesterday. And I actually went to the hospital this morning to pick up her heart because she's having her heart plasmized like mine. 
she wanted to donate a test to use as a teaching tool. But I went on last night after I learned of her death and I shared it with the group and we mourn together. We grieve together and we accept that HCM is something to be taken very seriously and that it doesn't always turn the way we want, but it's awful nice to have somebody there who understands your pain when something doesn't go quite right. So I think it's a little hard sometimes, but I'd rather be together than alone in circumstances like that. And I think the community wants that too. Both of these women who I mentioned were active and daily participants in the board. Um, so their presence will be missed. And, you know, there might be almost 4,000 people in that group, but the absence of two will be noticed. So what do you have to think about the grieving process on the, on Facebook and any thoughts to share? Did I lose you more? Sorry. I thought I lost you there for a minute. Any thoughts to share about grieving on Facebook and dealing with it? Oh, you mean for me? I thought you you asked the community. No, ask um, me. <laughs> um, well, there are two sides to it. I admire the people who, uh, with with honesty and sincerity, admit to their grief and pain, um, and and I think that's good. But on the other hand, um, it's not private because we have 3,600 members, so you always have to uh, be aware that you don't know who's reading it all and how it may um, may work out when, when this being read or heard or seen by somebody you would rather avoid. Mm -hmm. So um, I find it a very difficult balance. Um, yes. I tend to see only the positive side of it, and yet I realize that I don't know the other side uh, because we don't know everybody who's um, reading all that. So it's hard. It is. You have to balance with what, what you're saying and what you're sharing. And it is a closed group, which means yeah. your friends from your general Facebook page can't see this if they're not in the closed group as well. But families have HCM and family members join the board. And I've had families find family members by their participation in the board. Cousins and siblings finding each other again on our, our message yeah, board. I remember, I adopted, I remember that. An adopted family in Canada once. Somebody said, I think that's my, my brother because I was adopted and this is the age and it's the same gene and we've reunited families. It's crazy the things that we've been able to do on the internet. Yeah. So um, I, I think everybody needs to take those things into consideration and share with the community what they want to share, but know that when they're angry or frustrated or got some anxiety and they need to vent, we can hear it and, and we can share it with them and they can feel comfortable in sharing what they're comfortable in sharing. Willard just commented that uh, 16-year-old daughter was born with HCM. She's had a myectomy at three and three defibrillators. Two were defective. That's too bad. Uh, recalls are an issue that we do have to contend with, unfortunately, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and all, all devices. Um, I hope she's doing well now, and if there's anything HCM I can do for you, let us know. Um, any parting thoughts, Marianne? We'll wrap this up. I think we've covered quite a lot. I think we have too. But as <laughs> always, we can talk forever. We've talked in the United States. We've talked on the internet. We've talked on Skype. We've talked in Italy. Marion and I can talk a lot. <laughs> I thank you for being here today. Uh, on behalf of the community, thank you for being a moderator and taking such good care of the community. We do really appreciate it. So thank All you. All the thanks go to you, my dear. Well, thank you very much. All right, everybody, uh, we'll be back on in a couple of days with another interview. Um, I'm not sure who's up next, but we've got a couple more getting scheduled, and uh, we hope to bring you some more stories and some more physicians and some more of our fantastic moderators. Have a great day. Take care of each other. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.